The Big Story. What are you stopping for? I'm just for a minute, Blanche. I, uh, I just feel good being with you like this. Real good. Oh, come on. Stop it, Carl. I don't want to be late for the show. I like all the women, Blanche. I like you. I used to watch your house when you went out with other men. What? Now you're with me. Blanche, could, could, could I lean my head against your shoulder just for a minute? You're crazy. I knew I should never have given you a date. Only you kept pestering and pestering like, like a kid. I go on, get away from me. Let me out. Well, let's say you love me. Oh, you make me sick. You make Don't me sick. that. You ask for it, you make me sick. <laughs> now let me... No. No. <laughs> Salt Lake City, Utah. From the pages of the Salt Lake City Tribune, the story of a reporter who knew enough about children to catch a triple murderer. Salt Lake City, the story as it actually happened. T.R. Johnson's story as he lived it. Johnson, reporter for the Salt Lake City Tribune, drive along the main highway between Ogden and Salt Lake City. Everything seems just right. The new green sedan you're driving is slick to the touch. The sunset around you is warm and alive. And everything along the road is as familiar to you as the hat on your head. It ought to be. This is your beat. You've just passed through the Mormon town of East Hopeful, waved to a few friends, and now about a mile past Oh, you decide to stop the gas at no plant. Hi, T.R. How's the great report? Looking for a story now. Haven't you murdered your mother-in-law yet? Nope. Decided to let the old buzzard live till Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> What'll it be, T.R.? Fill her up now. Oh, sure thing. I like driving a new car. Oh, I like it fine. Especially driving on an evening like this, huh? Yeah, it's sure a great time of the year to be alive. <laughs> great time of the year to be alive, said the gas attendant. But at that very moment, back in East Hopeful, there was a man who thought otherwise. In the half-light of dusk, a man slowly dragged Blanche Wilson's body toward a field of tall, dry grass. He'd almost reached the grass when... Hey! Hey, you! What are you doing there? George, he's dragging something. Well, uh, I can't see him clearly. He's in the shadow. Hey, you! What are you doing in our field? George, I can't see him at all now. He's dead. Oh, no! Oh. Oh. You're back on the highway now, T.R. Johnson. On your way to Salt Lake City. At first, you don't notice that the road is strangely empty. As a matter of fact, you don't notice anything until suddenly you hear... You look into your rear view mirror... They must be after somebody else. Now, what you see in your mirror makes you slam your brakes on hard. The two troopers, guns drawn, are on you fast. Okay, you step out and don't try anything. But crying out loud, Carl Rifling, what's the matter? T.R. You're a lucky gent. If you hadn't stopped right off, we'd have started shooting. Shooting? Your car, T.R., green sedan. Same make, same color the murderer used to get away with. Wait a minute, Carl. What murderer? Back in East Hopeful. Fellow just killed three people. Green? Uh, listen, I can't let you go any further in this car of yours, T.R. It's a green sedan. Oh. So I guess you'd better follow us back to East Hopeful. You follow in the wake of the troopers. The warm, living sunset has suddenly turned into a frightening purple and black sky. A nice time to be alive in has become a time of death. When you drive back into East Hopeful, everything seems to have lost its familiar look. Everything looks eerie. Maybe it was death striking three times that did it. Maybe it was death itself. Still loose in these streets somewhere. You can feel it, even here in the chief's office. Nobody uh, got a look at him, chief? Nope. After we found Blanche Wilson and George Nell as York all dead, I phoned for roadblocks up and down. Figure we'll catch him before the night's out. Isn't, uh, 
Isn't there anything else you, uh, anything else anybody can do? Uh, sorry. Afraid I can't make it any more exciting for you. Oh, no, I didn't mean it that way, Chief. That's all right. Oh, uh, yeah, I almost forgot. I had a talk with Blanche Wilson's daughter, Jenny. Oh, what'd you have to say? Nothing. She was out when whoever it was called on Blanche. Oh. Doesn't anybody in town have any idea as to who he is? Nope. Everybody will know, though, as soon as we catch him. Look, Chief, I'm a, I'm a reporter now. I know it would be stupid of me to go traipsing around in my own car. But couldn't you let nope. me... No chance at all, T.R. I'd reach behind you there, find some checkers in the board. We can play a bit. Maybe later on we'll go out together and take a look around. You know Chief Harris as well as he knows you, T.R. Johnson. And it takes you just about ten seconds to figure out what the old man is up to. He knows there are hundreds of men out there in the dark with guns. He knows that you, as a reporter, might very easily get in the way of a bullet should you decide to go looking for the night by yourself. So, in his own neat way, he has you trapped. But without another car, you obviously can't join in the chase. You play checkers for about an hour. And with every tick of the old clock in Chief Harris's office, you get the feeling more jumpy and more helpless. Finally, no more, Chief. Oh, too bad. You going somewhere? I'm going to walk around town. Get some background material. Then I'll have my story all ready when you catch the murderer. Mm-hmm. Where do you think I'm going first? Thought I'd have a talk with Blanche Wilson's daughter, Jenny. Jenny. I'll be all right, Mrs. Coppin. You've been wonderful coming over like you did. Sure. At least anyone could do. That's your ring, Andy. Yes. Well, I'll take it. Don't you bother. Hello? Who? Jenny? Well, oh, I'll, I'll talk. It's the man, Jenny. Oh. Hello. Hello? Is that you, Jenny? Yes, who's this? Jenny... Is, is your mother there? Uh, who is this? Jenny, is your mother there? Mother? Mother's dead. Oh, isn't that too bad? I'll bet you be lost. Oh, please. Please, I don't want to talk about it now, please. Oh, you poor child. You feel awful, don't you? Yes, yes, but please. Well, I don't know how I feel. I just know how I feel. Mrs. Coppin. Mrs. Coppin. What is it, Jenny? What's wrong? A phone call is a stranger. I can't make it out. Jenny, this is Mr. Johnson. He's with the paper. He came in while you were on the phone. He just wants to help you. The phone call, Mrs. Coppin, it's upset me so. Someone you know? A man. I've never heard his voice before. So when I said I felt awful about mother, he... He started to cry. And he said, now you know how I feel. That's the weird thing. You've no idea whom your mother was with tonight? No. Mother's friends usually picked her up at the packing plant right after work. Oh, thanks. I won't bother you anymore. Mrs. Coppin, you heard him. He was a man, wasn't he? On the phone. He sounded like a man. He sounded more like a little boy. Crying. <laughs> Some of the women in the plant here told me you knew Blanche Wilson real well. Yes, I did, Mr. Johnson. Me being in the office, she'd drop in for a smoke and we'd talk. Uh-huh. Did she have many admirers? Too many. Oh, she wasn't bad. She just liked going out, that's all. That's the parking lot out that window, isn't it? Uh-huh. It belongs to the plant. In the daytime, I uh, imagine you can see clear over to the gate there, couldn't you? Clear over to the cafe, couldn't you? You're pushing, aren't you? That's my job. Yeah. Uh-huh. I can see right out to the gate and to the cafe. Ever see a green sedan waiting for Blanche? No. Mm-hmm. Well, I won't bother you anymore, Agnes. Thanks. Sure, anytime. Hey, hey wait. Yes? Uh, the way you said uh, admire is kind of threw me off. What do you mean? Well, oh, this fellow wasn't a boyfriend of Blanche's, so I didn't think of him when what you... What fellow? Oh, just a fat little clown who used to wait for Blanche regularly at the gate. 
Oh, no, no. He never would have gone out with him. Oh, why not? Well, Blanche used to laugh about him. He, uh... Well, if you were a woman, Mr. Johnson, you'd understand. I don't think he's important. Agnes, anything might be important, believe me. What, uh, what was wrong with him? Oh, well, I don't know. He begged her for a date, but... Well, it'd be more like he was just begging to be looked at. Oh, that sounds wrong. What would Blanche do? Well, sometimes nothing. Sometimes she'd just laugh. And he'd walk off slowly to the cafe by himself. To the cafe? Yeah, sometimes. Thanks. Thanks an awful lot, Agnes. For what? Remembering that fat little clown? Oh. He never even struck me like a man. He'd be more like... Oh, like a lost little boy. It's almost 11 at night when you leave the packing plant. You head across the black empty square to the cafe. A lost little boy. A little boy crying. Twice already you've heard that description, and your mind is pounding hard at it for the meaning inside that description. And at the moment that you're wrestling with that question, about 20 miles away, a mother and her son are on their way home from a church social. Hold my hand, Jasper, while we cross the road. Jasper, get caught! Ah! This is Cy Harris, returning as your narrator, and the big story of T.R. Johnson, as he lived it, and wrote it. To you, T.R. Johnson of the Salt Lake City Tribune, death has suddenly appeared in the personality of a lost little boy. Earlier tonight in the Mormon town of East Hopeful, death struck three times and vanished in a green sedan. But you've heard the possible killer described as being like a little boy who would sometimes go into the cafe to sulk. And now, you're at the counter of that very cafe. What's the beat here? Coffee, Grace. Black. Sure thing. How about a sweet roll to go with? No, thanks. Just coffee. Doing a story on the killing? Might. If I can get enough to write about. What with every pair of pants in the county stumbling around with a gun? Seems to me they should have caught the fellow by now. Well, they haven't, as far as I've heard. Can't they track down which of Blanche's admirers had himself a new green sedan? How about you? Me? What about me? Well, looking out of this cafe window here, you could just see any of Blanche's boyfriends waiting at the gate for her. And you don't have a green sedan? Maybe you're right at that, T.R. I don't recall a one. Grace, you remember a fat little fellow used to hang around pestering Blanche for a date? Him? Sure. <laughs> Poorest excuse for a man this side of wherever it is they make you, boy. How so? I used to come in here regularly either before or after Blanche to brush him off. And he'd always ask the same thing. Miss... Have you got a son? A son? Yeah. And I'd say, uh, sure. Then he'd turn as serious as a preacher who hadn't been paid in a year. He'd lecture me. What on? Don't make your son sad, miss. Treat him nice, miss. Give him things, miss. <laughs> the funny thing about that fat little fella, he must have had a poor memory, or else the subject was on his mind. Every time he'd come in, same question. Miss, have you got a son? Sounds queer to me. <laughs> I don't know. Just a good-natured slob. Grace, tell me. Did you ever get a good look at his car? Oh, go on, T.R. Don't tell me you suspect that little man. Why, it was nothing but an overdrive. Do me a favor. Think back. Did you ever see his car? See his car? Of course I saw his car. He gave me a left one. It was a green sedan. Oh, my. Thanks. Thanks a million. T.R., wait. He couldn't have done it. He, he, he was like a kid. <laughs> You rush out of the cafe and hurry through the midnight streets to Chief Harris's office. To you at the moment, the murderer is now the object of two chases. One along the dark highways by men with guns. The other is going on inside your own mind. Three times now, you've heard him described as a little boy. Desperately, you keep groping for the conclusion you know is hidden somewhere in your own mind. But like the murderer himself, the conclusion keeps slipping away, escaping you. It's in that frame of mind that you stalk into the police chief's office. Well, where have you been? He was roaring up and down the road, shooting at every woman he's seen. Three dead, three wounded already. Oh, no. Uh, what's more, we've lost him. No, I could kill him with my own hands. What do you say you've lost him? 
be still in the area somewhere. Can't you see? It's as plain as the nose in your face. Or as plain as that map here on my desk. Look, all three shootings took place close to Ogden. Ogden's a big city. Now, if I were a murderer, that's where I'd head, to a big city to lose myself. That's where he must be right now, heading into Ogden. No, he's not. But why not? Chief, look. Look. Mm-hmm. You've got the new shootings marked one, two, three. The line. The line they form. See for yourself. I don't know what you're driving at. Those three shootings form a line. There, you see it now? The murderer isn't heading into Ogden. He's heading back this way. Heading back this way? Why should he? Well, that's what I've been trying to fit together in my mind. Chief, uh, uh, listen to me. I'm, I'm no fancy psychologist, but when I, when I saw that map, it, it all seemed to fit in place. I don't know what you're talking about. Three times tonight I heard people describe a man. And every one of them used the same words, like a little boy. See, ah, that madman is out shooting up the countryside. I can't say here now. And it. every woman who met him or talked to him said the same thing. Like a little boy, a lost little boy. Well, he was maybe 30. Dan's Wilson was 45. He didn't want her like a man. He, he wanted her like a kid wants his mother. Oh, all right, I've heard enough. No, no, you haven't. I'm only telling you all this because I need your help. Grace over at the cafe definitely identified him even further. She said he drives a green today. Why didn't you say so before? I just got here, don't you see? Chief, he's like a child. A lunatic child. Lance must have given him a date and then got disgusted with him. So he had a tantrum, like a kid. Only in his case, it was a murderous lunatic tantrum. And it's still going on. But it's wearing off. That's why he's heading back this way. Because that's what a kid does when his tantrum wears off. He comes back to see how much damage he's done and to get his punishment. Okay. Okay, T.I. I think you're right. Let's go out and watch for him. There in the chief's office, you are absolutely sure of yourself. But now, sitting in the chief's car, most of your nerve is gone. You've both decided that the best place to watch is the cafe. You can feel the chief next to you, beginning to lose patience. After all... Who are you, T.R. Johnson, a reporter from Salt Lake City, to suddenly start figuring out the involved mind of a lunatic? Mm, it's getting late. Yeah, I know, I know. It's been here three hours now. Well, I'm going back to the office for a spell, T.R. All right, I'll, I'll spend watch out here in this vacant lot. A good deal at the cafe. You sure you want to stay? Yeah, for a while, Chief. Well, I'll drive back for you later. Now you're alone, all alone. The waiting and the autumn chill dig further into your reserve of confidence. But you begin to feel like a fool, a cold, lonely fool. So you decide to warm up a bit by walking quickly around the block. Nothing to lose, because if the car drives up in the stillness of the night, you'd hear it immediately. You start walking and hoping, hoping that something will happen to prove that you're not a fool. Well, I'll come around the counter and take your order. What'll it be? I don't know. I just feel so bad. Hot, um, coffee, maybe? Uh, how is everyone in town? In uh, town? They're very angry, aren't they? Angry? They must be. They must be. Um, would you, would you like some uh, coffee? Miss. Yeah? Miss. Do you have a son? Yeah. Don't make your son sad. Treat him nice. Get 
doing things. I, uh, I don't. I'll have some coffee. Hi, guys. I want some coffee, guys. Huh? I said I'd like some coffee. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Oh, sure, Chief. I can have some coffee. Mm-hmm. Really? Not a thing. Mm. I waited. Maybe I was wrong. Coffee, Grace. Now, for the first time since you came to the cafe, you think something is wrong. Grace has moved from where she was first standing. She has an empty cup in her hand and is frozen to the spot in front of the coffee room. Her eyes are looking past you to the booth which you can't see behind you. Anything wrong, Grace? Um, I'll, I'll get you coffee in, in a minute. As long as I serve that man behind you in the booth. You and the chief turn around slowly and crane your neck to look into the furthest booth. Suddenly, Grace's control goes to pieces and she... That's him! That's him! Don't just sit there! He's on, chief. He's ready. Oh, you don't. Take your hand out of your pocket. Take it out, I say. It's not a gun. Huh? I have a paper for you. Chief, it's a confession. All written now. <laughs> See? Yeah, I brought you a confession. <laughs> I didn't mean to hurt anybody. They, they just weren't nice to me, that's all. Nobody's ever been nice to me. So I hurt them a little to get even. That's all. We read you that telegram from T.R. Johnson of the Salt Lake City Tribune. At trial of murder in tonight's big story, he repudiated his confession. However, after brief deliberation, jury sentenced him for life to the state asylum, where he died two years later. In order to protect the names of people actually involved with in tonight's pathetic big story, the names of all characters in the conversation were changed with the exception of the newspaper reporter.